We ask everyone to fill out the cards there in your pews, and after the service, you can leave them in the offering plates at the entrances to the church. Before we do anything else, why don't we take a moment right here and greet the folks around you. Our order of service this evening is Divine Service Setting 3, which is printed in your bulletin or beginning on page 184 in our hymnals. We now begin with our opening hymn, hymn 948. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, 
I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you, of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our intro it from Psalm 16. Blessed be the Holy Trinity and the undivided unity. Let us give glory to him, because he has shown his mercy to us. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Blessed be the Holy Trinity and the undivided unity. Let us give glory to him because he has shown his mercy to us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, 
you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity in the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading comes from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson, a portion of which serves as the basis for the sermon, comes from the book of Acts in chapter 2. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And we rise to sing our response. The 
Holy Gospel is written in the third chapter of St. John, beginning at the first verse. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We now confess responsively, responsively the first part of the Athanasian Creed. Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will without doubt perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or three infinites, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, the Holy Spirit almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also are we prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father is not made, nor created, nor begotten by anyone. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. 
The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. Thus, there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshiped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. You may be seated for verse one of our creedal hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2. In the Pew Bible, this is found on page eight, uh, 1082, and I'll read again verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And let us pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you have revealed yourself to us in the pages of Holy Scripture, that even though to try to comprehend you is beyond uh, the ability of us frail and fallen humans, yet you come to us in your mercy and grace to bring about our redemption, to share in your love, and to participate in the great wonders of that which will be eternal. And so we pray that even as we may stumble at trying to understand these things, that we would gladly confess them as true. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I have heard people say on occasion that God in eternity was lonely. And so that's why he created us to have someone to, to be with him and to love and to be loved by him. And while I understand the sentiment, it's really a faulty sentiment because God was never alone. Now, there is only one God. This is true. There aren't multiples of gods out there in the universe. And yet, as the scriptures proclaim and as the church has confessed, this one God is in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so there was an es in the essence of God, there was a relationship already in eternity. And the nature of God is described as God is love. That's what John the Apostle writes in his first letter. And so love is not simply just that God existed in eternity with the feeling of love, because love is always an active thing geared towards another. And so the three persons of the Trinity from eternity interacted with each other in love. There was nothing lacking in God that made him have to make us so that he could have some companionship. He had it already and always in perfection from eternity as these three persons of the one God interacted with each other in love and carried that out. But again, human beings, we kind of stumble at this concept. We can understand three different gods or just one God, but one God, the essence, the stuff that makes God, God, and yet shared equally and completely, not in thirds, but completely 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yeah, that's, that, that causes our heads to explode. But the Trinity is not meant to be explained. It's meant to be confessed. If we completely understood God, well, he wouldn't be much of a God, would he? It would likely be something that we created for ourselves rather than what he has revealed for us. And you know, the wonderful thing about this is that the triune God in eternity already planned to create us, to make this physical creation so that we, his creatures, could share in this relationship of love that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had from all eternity and will continue to have for all eternity. It is a remarkable and amazing thing that in this love for one another, it poured out in creating the universe and each one of you. But of course, we fell, we rebelled, we wanted to be God ourselves, and of course that was not coming from a perspective of love, was it? But rather of selfishness, of sin. And uh, we came under judgment as a, as a, as a race, as a creation, as a, as a creature. And yet, in love, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had already planned how you were to be saved, and I was to be saved, and the world would be saved. The Son, willingly submitted to his father's will to take on human flesh and nature. It's interesting here, maybe, maybe fortuitous, that in Acts chapter 2, we see a very strong reference to the Trinity here in that verse that I read at the beginning of the sermon. And it comes right on the heels of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Jesus had already come and had brought about the atonement of the world's sins and reconciliation with God by his life, death, and resurrection. He ascended into heaven to fill all things and to be the head of his church, you and I and his Christians. And he told his disciples to wait until he sends the promise from the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Helper, who came then in force, if you will, on this day of Pentecost. And so Peter is preaching this sermon as all the crowds that had gathered in all the, from all these different languages and nations, and they are hearing about the gospel in their own language, and the Holy Spirit here has been poured out to bring about now the work of the church, the empowering of the church to go spread this news about the Son of God who died, lives, and rules forevermore, and who has brought about our redemption. And so Peter is laying out here um, not an explanation of the Trinity, but an explanation of the events that are unfolding. We are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. But this is what was prophesied by Joel. And then he talks about uh, God pouring out his spirit on all people. And... Uh, and we are witnesses of these things. And verse 33, he's speaking here about Jesus. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God. This is the ascension and exaltation of the Son of God who humbled himself to death, even death on the cross for us, and now is glorious, gloriously raised. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, Jesus, poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And so all three persons of the Trinity now are seen here in this verse, being active again for your salvation. That the very fact that, that Christ came and died for you and now lives forevermore would still be an impossibility for us to embrace on our own. And so it is through the power of the Holy Spirit working in this word that God the Father draws us through Christ to be his sons and daughters, heirs of eternal life. And it's a remarkable thing. This is love in all of its purest sense, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were powerless, the Holy Spirit called us by the gospel. While we were still at odds with ourselves and with each other, yet God has joined us as one with himself. 
And so here he has poured out the Holy Spirit that you are now seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, he goes on in verse 34, but he, he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And Peter caps off this section in verse 36 by saying, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Wow, talk about driving a spike right through the heart, huh? But that's what they needed to hear. The law of what they did that made the God of the universe have to go through all of this to bring about our redemption. But it also prepared them then to receive by the Holy Spirit's power faith in Jesus, to hear the gospel, to know that God has indeed been reconciled to us. And so again, there will be those who will probably say to you, oh, that Trinity stuff, that's crazy talk. And again, you can't explain the nature of God. You can only confess it and proclaim it. And that's what the creeds are doing, like the Athanasian Creed, like we use the first part, um, dealing with the Trinity itself. One God, not three gods. One Lord, not three lords. Yet the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. It's not trying to explain the Trinity, it's trying to proclaim what the scriptures say for our salvation so that the church won't go off into error and lose contact and lose salvation because they've lost the true God. The second half of the creed that we will speak in just a moment will deal more with the person of Jesus himself because 1700 years ago those were some pretty controverted issues in the church and the church had to go back to the scriptures to know what is true and to be able to proclaim what is true according to the will of God and so uh, whether you're talking of the Apostles Creed which is just a very simple explanation of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit or the Nicene Creed which gets a little bit more technical or the Athanasian Creed which must have you must have thought there was a room full of lawyers that got together and were looking for every loophole possible. Well, they weren't lawyers. They were godly men, leaders in the church, who simply said, how can we confess this and proclaim this about God as he has revealed himself to us to get rid of any chance that somebody would misunderstand? And so that's what they did. We celebrate Trinity Sunday once a year, because it is a doctrine that we kind of take for granted. We see it in our liturgies completely. Every time somebody is baptized, they are baptized in the Trinity, in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We begin our services in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see the Apostle Paul giving us the, bened the Pauline benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, always. And so we confess with the church, those very things that the scriptures have revealed from the mouth and hand of God. We confess that there is only one God, and yet in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who loved each other and loves each other through all eternity and has loved you as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep each of your hearts and minds in true faith to life eternal. Amen. We continue with singing the second verse of the creedal hymn. rise to responsibly confess the second part of the Athanasian Creed. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man, born from the substance of his mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh. Equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two, but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. We continue with verse 3. In our prayers this evening, we pray for John Lipsky, who will undergo surgery on Thursday. We pray for those recovering from recent surgery, Ed Adler, Cheryl Smith, Marcy Patswitz, and DJ Man Mannion. Uh, we continue to pray for strength and healing for Elmer Ostrander, Gail Forbing, Wallace Warner, Vicki Schweigert, and Aaron Shue. And we give thanks to God for Rob and Shelley Souls as they celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. At the conclusion of our prayers, we continue with the service of the sacrament. Let us pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, as you sent your Son to bring about our redemption, so also you and, your, and our Lord Jesus have sent forth the Holy Spirit that we may be empowered to believe in Jesus as our Redeemer and to trust the scriptures and to live as your dear children. We thank you, O Lord, for the love that you have poured out upon us who were unworthy of such love and you have made us partakers in that which is eternal and divine. And so we pray that even when human reason stumbles and staggers at trying to understand you as you have revealed yourself to us, yet may we confess with joyfulness and praise those things you have revealed in your holy word. Be with John as he will undergo surgery on Thursday. We pray that this time it will help him and be successful May your blessing be upon him. We also pray for Ed, Cheryl, Marcy, and DJ as they are recuperating from their surgeries. Bless their recoveries, O Lord, and be with them from day to day. We pray that you would grant strength and healing to Elmer, Gail, Wallace, Vicki, and Aaron. Help them, O Lord, and be with them in their particular needs. Uphold and keep them, we pray, in your mercy and love. We rejoice with Rob and Shelley as they celebrate 25 years of marriage. You have blessed them, O oh Lord, with their family and with, uh, with your love for them. Continue to help them look to the years ahead and work together in fulfillment of their marriage vows that they would love and care for each other and be a blessing to their family and rejoice in your goodness to them through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray, O oh Lord, on this Memorial Day weekend 
we give you thanks for the service and, and the laying down of life that so many within our armed forces since our country's founding have done that we may enjoy the blessings of liberty. Oh, Lord, be with the families of those who have died recently, that they may be comforted in your mercy and grace. Let us all take time to remember the sacrifices that were made for us and that we would never take these sacrifice and freedoms for granted. Be with all who travel over this holiday weekend. Keep them safe in their travels, we pray. All of this we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, who with your only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit are one God, one Lord. In the confession of the only true God, we worship the Trinity in person and the unity in substance of majesty co-equal. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Our service continues with the Nunc Dimittis, and we rise. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. O oh God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.